Welcome, everyone. I'm Jeremy Piven. I am a professional actor. I work here in Hollywood in films and in television. And life gets a little crazy and busy, and you need a break. You're fired. You're gone. I'm not fired. Yes, you're right. You need me more than ever. People usually take a quick trip, you know, down to Cabo or to South Beach. I decided to go halfway across the world to India. <laughs> Why India? That is a good question. I'm a student of the culture, of yoga and meditation, of all those things. My house is filled with artifacts from there, and that is why I wanted to go see and put a face to it. I wasn't actually prepared for what happened. Sure, I saw the temples and the architecture, but I also experienced the complexity and the chaos, and I had certain experiences that I will carry with me for my whole life. It wasn't always easy, but it changed my life. And isn't that what a journey of a lifetime is about? After traveling 10,000 miles in 36 hours, I finally arrived in Bombay. I was in a daze from the endless flights and the 13 and a half hour time change. India has always been a mysterious place that I've wanted to visit all my life. On the drive from the airport, my senses were immediately assaulted by the heat, the smoke, and the noise. The India of my imagination slammed into the reality of its largest city, Bombay. This crazed, dense, funky place with people everywhere. As I arrived at the hotel, the bombardment of the senses continued as I stumbled upon the loudest wedding procession I'd ever heard. That's when I realized that sleep was not going to be an option. By the time the sun rose the next morning, I got my first glimpse of Bombay by day. I started to explore the city of 20 million people, which is basically on the other side of the world from the United States. Bombay sits on India's western shore and juts out into the Arabian Sea. In 1995, Bombay's official name was changed to Mumbai, but to most people, the names are interchangeable. Bombay's huge, with a population the size of Los Angeles and New York combined. You know, it's funny, when I was telling people back in the States, I said, you know, I'm getting my shots, I'm getting it all locked down. And they said, forget about the shots, forget about malaria. Think about the traffic. I had plenty of time to soak up the sights as I drove to the main market. It's very bizarre. Bombay is a city of contrasts. It's got some amazing Victorian architecture in the middle of this chaotic urban mess. The ghetto. I mean, you know, we grew up in Chicago. We've seen some ghettos and we have some references, but wow, look at that. Look at this, man. Shukriya. But you just never know what's going to be right around the corner. Amidst the cacophony of the traffic, I saw this structure that looked like a gingerbread house. It turned out to be a temple. Uh, this is a temple of uh, goddess Kali. And Kali is, is the god of what exactly? This is a mother god. The mother, Kali, god. mother god of power. Rajiv briefly explained to me the significance of some of the Hindu deities. Kali destroys evil and ignorance, and Ganesh brings good luck. That lady is offering some leaves, some flowers, some milk. Hindus make offerings of fruits, flowers, and money, a way to honor the gods and to seek good fortune. OK, so we're going to go make an you offering. Just keep it in your hand. You have to offer to the god when you go take. At 
the end of the ritual, the priest anointed me with holy ash, making a third eye in honor of the god Shiva, an outward symbol of an inward spiritual journey all Hindus hold sacred. There's a lot to take in. It was kind of a, a beautiful ritual. She kept clanging the bell. It was almost as if it was clearing out the cobwebs inside of my brain. And it was just very, you know, overwhelming the smells and the flowers and the pungent smell. And the, it's a beautiful tradition that they have there. jumped back in the car and continued my journey to very bizarre. We're gonna meet up with a, a couple of girls, Natasha and Virginia, who are actually makeup artists on a movie that a guy that I went to high school with, Ajay, worked on. They're gonna kind of take us to this market, which should be really, really fun. So many different types of people come here. A lot of, um, it's a Muslim neighborhood, but there's a Hindu temple nearby, so people live side by side. Natasha was born in Bombay, and Virginia moved here three years ago from England. And if you look out, you just see the madness everywhere. Right, right. And you get a real sense of, oh my god, where am I? Uh, I I'm getting a sense of, oh my god, where am I at every anyway. moment, to be honest with you. I'm in a constant state of, oh my god, where am I? My man's just sleeping right here. Catching his nap when he can. It's a difficult city to live in. It's fabulous in one sense. And you feel like you're a better person from living here. I think you become a more interesting person. If you, if you go with India and you sort of accept it, don't try and change it, accept it. See the beauty in it in a lot of things. Right on. Accept it. Don't try to change it. That's my new mantra. As I walk through the crowded bazaar, I try to keep that in mind. I couldn't get over the sheer number of people, motorbikes, and cars. The horns never stopped, but somehow, no one got run over. In search of some escape from the bedlam of the market, we entered the courtyard of the Mumba Devi Temple. The temple, built in 1675, is named after the goddess Mumba. It's amazing if you contrast what's going on outside to in here. It's Serene. Yeah, it's beautiful, and, peaceful. Yeah, and that will happen all over India. It'll be mad moments and then just a lovely energy. It's nice to have this. Nice to breathe, have a little room. I like it. The colors are incredible. I'm thinking about um, going to do one of these fortune teller things. If you could do it with me, that would be great. Right here. Namaste. You ask me, have you come to ask anything specifically? I have many questions for him. Can you tell him your name, then when you ask questions accordingly, he'll give you answers. Tell him my name is Jeremy. 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 J. J. He's got to make a quick phone call. <laughs> That's like a spiritual phone book. That's deep. Beautiful. Should I pursue my spiritual ways or should I pursue my acting? He said right now they're both working for you. You should pursue your acting, but you have to look to God morning and evening because it's only due to God that this happens. Why am I still single? I am 200 years old. <laughs> Does he understand or he just stops having to stop? He said after a year, you'll get married. In one year? One year, yeah. Wow. That's like a ticking clock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's pressure. <laughs> and the one you find, your values and your everything will be very similar. She's going to be a super freak. Thank you so much. Shukraya. <laughs> That was incredible. Um, he said I would be married in a year, which is, I need to call my mom immediately because she's waiting by the phone for that type of information. It's very exciting. To escape the 197% humidity and claustrophobia of the bazaar, Natasha, Virginia, and I sought the relative tranquility of Juhu Beach in northern Bombay. It's a place where locals come to breathe some sort of fresh air and cool off from the oppressive tropical heat. So people come down to the ocean, but if the water is so dirty, you can't actually get in the ocean. Really. People tend to go in their clothes. So you'll see women in saris or sawa kameezas going into the ocean. And everyone comes to eat and have fun yeah. and be part of it. It's like a carnival atmosphere. This is what 
people come for just open space. So in Bombay, to have this, it's a luxury. Yeah. It's the biggest luxury in Bombay space. Usually you just see like the middle class coming here. It's a very family oriented thing. So for the middle class, it's just somewhere to get out because Bombay is so crowded so busy and there's nowhere to go, there are no parks, there's nothing really. You live on the beach in LA, is this like shocking for you? Our beach is totally different, it's just like, you know, a couple of golden retrievers, Pam Anderson, and just nothing. You've traveled a long way to be here. Yeah. This is the Arabian Sea, Africa's over there, Arabia's over there, the Middle East. I'm, am I'm amazed by how the people will look at you. There's a warmth to all the people, and they're not aggressive. They're very peaceful, even though they're living in very extreme conditions. And there's like an innate um, spirituality here that's very thick. I'm Jeremy Piven. I'm a long way from Los Angeles, exploring India and expanding my understanding of a country that means so much to me. I experienced a lot of emotions on my first day in Bombay. Laughter was not really one of them, but this city does have a sense of humor. My friend, how do you say hello in Hindi? That's a silent treatment. I got up at the crack of dawn on the second day because a buddy of mine told me about the Laughing Club of India. Laughter Club is all about joy. Yes. Joy is in the present moment, nothing about past, nothing about future. Once you feel good inside, everything changes outside. Laughing yoga, as they call it, was started in Bombay by Dr. Madan Kataria to utilize the simplest form of therapy, laughter, in order to improve people's lives. Very good. Very good. Very good. From your heart. This is called hearty laughter. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> the idea behind laughing yoga is that light stretching and hearty laughter helps you live longer. <laughs> to me, it was more borscht belt yoga than the real deal, but who can argue with joy? Hold kijiye, hold kijiye, hold. <laughs> the happiest people in the world! The laughing is contagious, apparently, spreading to thousands of chapters worldwide. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, start. <laughs> After the group laughter, the session ended with a group hug. You know, I'm running 70. No. And I walk eight kilometers in the morning when I come over here. How old are you? 17. Mm. 17? Seven. Yeah, 17. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jeremy is Mr. 70 years old. Wow, my 17 God. 17 years. If you laugh, everyone is laughing with you. If you weep, nobody's weeping with you. Be happy, don't worry. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the laughter. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. I was expecting a more active yoga experience, but you know, there was something powerful in the simple act of laughing. It just it made me feel incredible. <laughs> Back in the car, the laughter started fading in my ears, replaced by the honking of horns. This is how they relate to each other, but could they bring it down a little? Driving around Bombay, one thing you notice for certain is that children are everywhere. The fresh-faced kids in their school uniforms. But you can't ignore the homeless children, the skinny kids surviving on the streets. It's straight up heartbreaking. After seeing these kids, my perspective changed. I decided to go to Project Crayons. It's a grassroots program that is making a difference amongst the madness that is Bombay. We are a group of 24 volunteers, like housewives, college students. So whenever we get them, we drop in and try to link the kids with this fun, spend time with the children, you know. And then ultimately, um, I, like I asked you before, will, they, will you try to find them homes, or how does that work? when they get older. Yeah, here, uh, 
they are staying with us and we look out the sponsors from outside who sponsor their studies but they stay with us. Karuna told me that the program started nine years ago and recently moved into this 650 square foot apartment. It's a tiny space where up to 50 kids live, sleep, play and learn. No, this is the smallest baby. Say hi. Hi, Nolo. Smile, Karo. Say hi. Namaste. <laughs> Yeah. Let me ask you, where did you find Maya? Uh, Maya actually, uh, been, uh, we found her at Andheri station out here. Uh, she, her mother is expired and father is like drug addicted and not taking care of. And she is with us for past eight months now. And when she, we have bought her, she is like completely half dead. And she was under a medical treatment, she was malnutrition, she couldn't uh, lift her hands, like she can't walk. And now she's perfectly fine, you know, doing yeah, well. And, and, uh, in fact, she started going to school now. She is into uh, uh, a nursery now, going to a nursery now. That's for you, Maya. That's all you. Okay, that's it. Okay. What would it cost for each child for uh, a year? For a year, it comes to 10,000 for one child, for, for one child. academic year. 10,000 rupees is only about $200, less than the cost of a car payment. Let me ask you, in terms of finding the kids on the streets, yeah. is it kind of increased and now kind of more than ever you're finding kids? First thing, we have to check whether the child is connected to any begging mafia or not. Though it's only a small percentage of street kids, the begging mafia is an unfortunate and horrible reality in which kids turn over their earnings to a street boss. The time that the kids spent with me was an unbelievable gift that humanized Bombay. The intensity of the city was softened by this oasis that was inspiring and humbling. The faces of these children, these open, beautiful faces and beings, whenever I would pick up a child, it was just this feeling of calm. They would just kind of melt into you. I'll never, ever, ever forget that. Bye, bye. Bye, my, bye my little nieces. Namaste. Namaste. Bye, thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Bye. Namaste. Bye. Bye. Bye, Maya. Maya. It was so incredibly hard to leave these kids, and they made me realize that despite the kind of rough exterior of Bombay, there's still amazing love and kindness that goes on when you pull the veil, and uh, I'll never forget it. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Piven. My two days in Bombay were intense. Bye, Maya. After riding an emotional roller coaster, I was ready to get out of the maximum city. Escape from Bombay. I have to say that I, I became very highly sensitive to the smells and the clanging and the beeping and everything it was really overwhelming. It's an, an assault on all of your senses. And there's a, a feeling of the sanctity of life and the worthlessness of life, all at the same time living together in some sort of harmony. Um, it'll be interesting to get into a simpler, easier um, lifestyle, way of living than this. My next stop, Kerala, located on the southwestern tropical coast. Kerala hugs the Arabian Sea down to the bottom tip of the country. I wanted to come to Kerala to chill, check out the beach and the famous backwaters. From the air, I could see the lush green countryside open up before me. Kerala is called God's own country for its diversity of natural beauty. From the mountains, the terrain gradually slopes down to the coast. Rice fields, coconut plantations, and the beautiful backwaters, which are an interconnected system of canals that run virtually the length of the state. Kerala is a religiously diverse region. Christians still thrive alongside Hindus, Muslims, and even a handful of Jews who remain in the regional capital of Cochin.
I'm a Jew. I'm in Jewtown. Yeah. Right? Yes. All right. I don't know about you, man, but where I'm from, if anyone says something like Jewtown, I don't know. I mean, they better be ready to throw down. You know what I'm saying? It says, uh, beware of agents uh, telling you not to shop here in Jewtown. But apparently, the Jews settled here and uh, built the first temple here over 500 years ago and uh, had a, a scuffle with the Portuguese. One thing led to another. There were many Jews that were here. They went to Israel. There's a handful left. This stuff looks amazing. You guys welcome Jews? Yeah. Fantastic. This area was primarily inhabited by Jews for centuries, and the locals told me that Jewtown is a descriptive and not a derogatory term. Thank God. Cochin was famous for its spice markets. Now it's become a semi-touristy bazaar of shops selling antiques that range from Oh my God, I have to have that too. Wow, that's not right for me. I decided to grab some stuff from my place. Hi, namaste. Um, this right here is, which god is this? This is Dancing Shiva. Dancing Shiva. Yeah, Shiva of is course. the god. Yeah. Shiva, beautiful god. Oh, that's not a good way to start. I'm sorry. What? He keeps doing it. Are you purposely doing it? I, I'm not, my friend. It just keeps falling. As I got back into the street, I saw windows laced with swastikas. I was relieved to learn that the swastika is actually a symbol holy to the Hindus. It comes from an ancient Indian language called Sanskrit, and it means good luck. Hitler ripped it off for his own particular brand of madness. This is the Paradise Synagogue, built in 1568 by descendants of Spanish, Dutch, and other European Jews, and preserves a unique record of Jewish presence in India. This is a part of Jewish life that I, I knew nothing about, so to learn about that at this part of my journey was totally unexpected. How are you? Namaste. I see you're a star of David. David. You are Jewish. Jewish. I'm Jewish as well, and I'm from the United States. How, do you know how many Jewish people? 14 have, people and four families. 14 people and four families are left. Oh my God, that's amazing. All of them are going to Israel. To the motherland. motherland. And why have you stayed here? You, Hardly. You don't want to go to Israel? No. You want to stay here? Yeah. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Shalom. 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 You have a place that we kind of associate with just kind of one specific religion. And yet there are so many that have kind of congregated here. It's amazing to go and connect with this Jewish woman, you know, just a couple of, a couple of old Jews connecting halfway around the world. It's a, it's a face that I'll never forget. Incoming, you know what I'm saying? It's the beautiful mom pa Russian roulette of coffee. It's fantastic. Want the latest on Discovery HD Theater? Then visit us online. Head to discovery.com slash HD for program info, weekly schedules, and viewer message boards. Discovery HD Theater, your window on the world is on the web. This is Exploring Our Universe, an HD special report. It's not easy to see a total solar eclipse. They're very rare, but this week, astronomers and stargazers alike were able to watch thanks to NASA TV and NASA.gov, who covered the event in full detail. The eclipse cast a shadow over a path that began in Brazil, extended across the Atlantic to Northern Africa, then into Central Asia, and eventually ended at sunset in Northern Mongolia. Total solar eclipses are of particular interest to scientists, since it's their only chance to study the sun's corona. No one can figure out why the corona is so hot, with temperatures reaching one to two million degrees Fahrenheit, while the surface of the sun is only about 10,000 degrees. This eclipse lasted four minutes, giving astronomers time to gather critical information that may help unravel the mystery. The first test images from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter gave scientists a tantalizing preview of the upcoming mission. This view shows the total area covered by the orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, or HiRISE. The quality is spectacular, 
with no hint of any smear or blurring. This full-res close-up shows an area in Mars' mid-latitude southern highlands. These samples give NASA the opportunity to test the camera settings and set up calibration and processing procedures for the mission. More than 25 gigabytes of imaging data were sent from the orbiter to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where the pictures were processed. That's enough to fill nearly five DVDs. Down on the surface of Mars, the rovers demand lots of care as winter quickly approaches. One of Spirit's six wheels has stopped working, and the rover is in trouble. Limping along, it must reach a slope where it can catch enough sunlight to make it through winter. Spirit is currently getting only enough power to operate for about one hour per day, and the supply is dropping fast. The right front wheel of the rover has had NASA worried for a while. It's been drawing an unusual amount of current. Last week on the 779th Martian day, the motor that rotates the wheel stopped working. These wheel motors have rotated more than 13 million times, far more than anyone ever expected. Stay tuned for weekly mission updates in high def, only on Discovery HD Theater. Let's go check out my cars. This is my 56 Chevy big window cam pickup. Over there is my 56 Chevy convertible. This car almost cost me a marriage. It's an art form. Imagine two cars coming around the bank at 100 miles an hour. I don't think I'm going to chase that guy. I want to do a muscle car themed expedition. We're not going to sleep for another 74 hours. Where else can you see late model imports with the aftermarket turbochargers, body kits, slamming into the water, people clapping and cheering? I hope I don't get a speeding ticket because this thing's really going to haul me. It's everything that Americans like. Lots of smoke, lots of horsepower. It's exciting. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Piven. I had been in southern India for a day and I was really enjoying not only the laid back beach vibe of Kerala, but I was also enjoying the connection that I felt with the people, especially this really cool old woman in Jew town. It really is a small world. Our connections are, are so much closer than we imagine. One reason for my journey to India had been to experience yoga at the place where it was born 5,000 years ago. So while at the Marari Village Hotel, I arranged to have a class with a master teacher. Namaste. Namaste. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. Nice to see you. What is your name? Krishna Kurup. Jeremy Krishna. Okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank what you. What kind of yoga are we going to do today? I am doing the Ashtanga yoga. The Ashta means eight and the Anga means parts. I was uh, really excited for this moment. Finally, my first yoga class in India. What kind of yoga you are? Well, I mean, I've done everything from Iyengar to Bikram. I've done some Kundalini. Krishna started me off with the sun salutation, which is an asana or sequence that stretches every part of the body. He wanted to know what my reference for yoga was, so I showed him a few poses on my own. If you look closely, he's actually reversing his hands here. That's a pose that most NFL linemen couldn't do, let alone a 65-year-old man. The class was exactly the type of yoga I was looking for. I've never been taught by someone with this level of experience. To have a master teacher conducting a private class in a setting like this is the way I think yoga was intended. Later that day, I decided to jump in a car and take in the beautiful countryside. This region is known for everything from spice and tea plantations to pristine lakes. India is one of those places that the unexpected happens all the time. As we were driving, I saw an amazing sight. Holy. <laughs> Incoming, you know what I'm saying? Incoming. Suddenly we look over and there is a procession of a couple of hundred women with these incredible colored umbrellas and saris. Hold on, there's an elephant behind us. We need to. And we get out, and there is a beautiful elephant. This 
procession was for a Hindu festival celebrating Ganesh, the elephant god. For the villagers, rituals like these are woven into the fabric of their lives. But for me, it was a once in a lifetime glimpse into another religion. After seeing this procession, I decided to change my plan. I went back to ditch the car and rent a motorcycle. I wanted to hit the back roads. Do you remember Marlon Brando in uh, Wild One? This ain't it, it's a scooter, but it's the closest I could get. Pretty excited about this. Oh, jeez. Let's see, hold on. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all I got, I got. putting that to good use, that will be a boat. That will be used. I don't know where the horn is. It's the beautiful mom, pa, Russian roulette of coffee. It's fantastic. Hi, nice to see you. Can we get some coffee? Fantastic. Look at that, it's that simple. Look at my man. Do you think the Bears have a shot against Atlanta? Yeah. He'll work on their offense. Uh -huh. Yeah. He's saying, and I agree with him, it's a, the biggest variable is the field conditions. Um, Atlanta looks great. They obviously have a great scrambling quarterback in Michael Vick. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I arrived in a village called Marari and was assaulted by, by a smell of, it's a, 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 well, it was a bad smell. The catch of the day is dried in the sun as it has been for hundreds of years. And it actually smells that way. It's dried there in order to preserve it actually. It's just amazing. It's just like the land that time forgot. It's incredible. These guys are such hard-working people, it's unbelievable. These people have been doing this probably for 20 generations, doing their thing fishing. If you were to take a still of this, you could insert it into any century. It's, it's amazing. This is what I was looking for, this type of thing that, that could only happen right here. As the fishermen left the coast and I left the village, I felt more immersed in the culture. I was glad that I had tossed the maps and taken this impromptu ride. I was in the state of Kerala and headed to a local port to hitch a ride upriver to the Kanatu Devi Temple. I was going there to see a special performance in the middle of the jungle. Backwaters of Kerala are a thousand mile network of canals and tributaries. These are the freeways of southern India. Applying these timeless waters are houseboats called Kedavalums. They're made of wood and coconut rope out of necessity, resulting in something really beautiful. Traditionally, people have lived almost full time on these boats, but now they have been converted into pimped out floating hotels. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Ah, yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I think I found my spot. Oh, oh beautiful. Mm. This is it. Do you, you need some help? Yeah, no. You're good? <laughs> I know you are. Give it a good push, man. Oh, say goodbye to land. What a beautiful choice.
Tourists usually rent these boats out for a day trip, but I meandered my way up north, taking this baby into the heart of the backwaters. This is it, this is what we've been looking for. Total peace and tranquility. Why someone would choose to live in Bombay with a million people per square mile? When you have this, it's one man talking, but I, I so prefer this. I could live on this houseboat and, uh, you know, be their 11th mate to have one. I don't know if mates go past three or two or one, but I would be that guy. Right? I've got your back, man. It's like perfect weather conditions. This is God's country. Wow. Look at this tiny little island. It's beautiful. People live there. Simple, peaceful life, man. See, my problem is that I, I thought that I would do this and then never go home. It could be like, whatever happened to that guy? I'm gonna be like the Eastern European Jewish Dave Chappelle. What happened to Jeremy? He went to India. He hit that spiritual side, he got a swerve on. He went crazy in India. On that houseboat, I lost all track of time. I really just let go of everything. It's that instant when you're traveling and you finally arrive and you realize that the journey is the destination. That's the call for them to go to the mosque for their fourth, fifth time of the day. We're going to the end of the river. People live, work, go to school. They just exist along these lovely banks. If, if someone was peeking into my bathtub, I would be like, get out. That's my man's bathtub. The rice paddies nestled amongst the mosques, churches, and temples made me feel like I found a special place. As the sun started to head towards the horizon, I finally arrived at my destination. It was a small temple called Kanatu Devi. Here, smack dab in the middle of nowhere, a troupe of actors were preparing for a traditional Katakali theater performance. Cool. See, just that first look reminds me of, of me doing theater in Chicago. I did Commedia dell'arte forever, and we would always work in whiteface, and it would take us a couple hours to put on our makeup, and that spirit and the energy they have over there feels very familiar to me. Katakali is a theater dance form. It combines dance, acting, makeup, and music to retell and interpret ancient Hindu myths and legends. Luba Shield is the director of the Vijnana Kalavedi Cultural Center. She moved from France over 35 years ago and found her spiritual and artistic home here. How old is this form of the face painting? No, this art form is like 300 or more year old, but it's issued from so many traditions from Kerala, uh, which are ritual or uh, classical. And they had a lot of painting like that, using the nature and the leaf of the trees and painting their face. The actors spend two, three, sometimes five hours putting on their makeup. During that time, they can't talk because the creases can ruin the meticulous design. More importantly, as they are applying their face paint, they are actually transforming themselves into their character, a queen, a god, or a demon. It's not of the same world as the ordinary world. It's beyond your reach, the humility, the devotion makes you a fit instrument to rise yourself and help the audience to rise to a higher level. This is what Indian art thinks art to be. Yes, I think that's the art at its highest form. It's In, beautiful. You know, when you're, when you're creating, the best way to create is when you get out of your own way and you're a vessel yeah. for something greater than yourself, yeah. and that's what you're talking about. The music helps the actors to get into a, a feeling. Mm -hmm. But what we do is, which is a very Western way, is simply to take your iPod and listen to some music. 
you know, that gets you into that mood, yeah. and then you go right into it. So I think it's universal what you're speaking yeah. of. An eerie sounding call let the villagers know that the performance was about to begin. It was time for the troupe to tell their story. The musicians called out to the village, but really, it was a call out to the spirits. I knew I was gonna witness something really profound. I'm Jeremy Piven. I had been in southern India for four days, and I had traveled upriver to a remote part of Kerala for a sacred performance of an ancient Indian art form called Katakali. I had a feeling that this would be a culmination of my journey through India's cultural and artistic heritage. This is amazing. I can't wait to see it. This is going to be beautiful. I was startled when the beating of drums and the clang of cymbals began. The plot is a parable from the Hindu epic poem, the Mahabharata. It's basically the story of a queen and her two sons who battled a horrible demon who was about to cannibalize an entire village, and in the end, gets defeated. Since there was no dialogue, each movement, each hand gesture, each roll of the eye had to convey all of the emotion. The nuances that these actors had without saying one word are the things that separate a good actor from an incredible actor. These artists had the goods. After the performance ended, I waited to meet the actors as they took off their makeup. As I sat with the performers, the magic of the evening continued when I found out about a connection I had with the lead actress. So halfway around the globe, and we come to see this beautiful performance, and um, I noticed that there's this actress on stage who's playing so truthfully with her eyes, and all the emotions are coming right out of her eyes, the, the tragedy, the, the deep sadness. And there's almost something very familiar about her work. She comes out afterwards, and it, it, it's been revealed that we, we both share the same teacher, which is just un, unbelievably uh, mind-blowing and incredible. She explained to me that people come to see a Katakali performance because it is a mirror into the spirit world. Some people get confused because when you open yourself up to be closer to God, then they start thinking that those people are or maybe God. People come to see the God. They don't come to see you or me or any actor. They come to see the God. Come to see the God. The people come also because very famous actor who play particularly very good God. Mm -hmm. So it's mixed in also. What do you think happens when an actor who works hard and does his thing is, becomes famous, do you think? Famous, it's not a problem. I mean, after it's don't forget uh, what you are on the stage. It's be connected to your art and still to be famous. Yeah. Is an interesting dance. Yeah, it's an interesting dance. I woke up the next morning still thinking about the experience. We're watching this group with the most dedication of almost any artist around. I mean, these people that this, the man that was um, playing the demon takes a seed that irritates his eye puts it in there and, and reddens up everything. That artist journey, I, I'm so excited to share that with people and I'll never forget that. If I ever bitch about my trailer again, I'm gonna put on the Kata, Katakali troupe and just have someone just whip me because that is, that. those are real artists. Those are real, real, real artists. There's a sense of real commitment and community that I completely identify with. It was so, so kind of, confirming to see and the metaphor is not lost on me at the end of the river in the middle of, the no of nowhere halfway across the world there is this absolute connection a tie that um, is so confirming and beautiful my whole trip to India has been about finding connections 
It was only days ago that I arrived in Bombay. And yet, amidst the chaos, the humanity touched me. My trip to the South opened my eyes to an aspect of India I could not have even imagined a few days ago. In Cochin, when I met a beautiful old woman, I discovered that shared values transcend age, distance, and language. They transcend really everything. And what you find is that we're all just different strains of the same people. We're all connected. You get the sense of what it must have been like to land here hundreds of thousands of years ago. This is kind of this beautiful, untouched land. Oh man, so much has happened to me in my time in India. I feel like it's just inhabited me and there is so much more for me to explore. I just, I want to keep going. Welcome everyone, I'm Jeremy Piven. I am a professional actor. I work here in Hollywood in films and in television and life gets a little crazy and busy and you need a break. You're fired. God. I'm on fire. Yes, you're right. You need me more than ever. People usually take a quick trip, you know, down to Cabo or to South Beach. I decided to go halfway across the world to India. Why India? That is a good question. I'm a student of the culture, of yoga and meditation, of all those things. My house is filled with artifacts from there, and that is why I wanted to go see and put a face to it. I wasn't actually prepared for what happened. Sure, I saw the temples and the architecture, but I also experienced the complexity and the chaos. The ghetto. I mean, you know, we grew up in Chicago. We've seen some ghettos, and we have some references, but wow, look at that. Look at this, man. Shukriya. But you just never know what's going to be right around the corner. Amidst the cacophony of the traffic, I saw this structure that looked like a gingerbread house. It turned out to be a temple. Uh, this is a temple of uh, goddess Kali. And Kali is, is the god of what exactly? This is a mother god. The mother Kali, god. The mother god of power. All right. Shen. Rajiv briefly explained to me the significance of some of the Hindu deities. And I had certain experiences that I will carry with me for my whole life. Ah! It wasn't always easy, but it changed my life. And isn't that what a journey of a lifetime is about? After traveling 10,000 miles in 36 hours, I finally arrived in Bombay. I was in a daze from the endless flights and the 13 and a half hour time change. India has always been a mysterious place that I've wanted to visit all my life. On the drive from the airport, my senses were immediately assaulted by the heat, the smoke, and the noise. The India of my imagination slammed into the reality of its largest city, Bombay. This crazed, dense, funky place with people everywhere. As I arrived at the hotel, the bombardment of the senses continued as I stumbled upon the loudest wedding procession I'd ever heard. That's when I realized that sleep was not going to be an option. By the time the sun rose the next morning, I got my first glimpse of Bombay by day. I started to explore the city of 20 million people, which is basically on the other side of the world from the United States. 
Bombay sits on India's western shore and juts out into the Arabian Sea. In 1995, Bombay's official name was changed to Mumbai, but to most people, the names are interchangeable. Bombay's huge, with a population the size of Los Angeles and New York combined. You know, it's funny. When I was telling people back in the States, I said, you know, I'm getting my shots, I'm getting it all locked down. And they said, forget about the shots, forget about malaria. Think about the traffic. I had plenty of time to soak up the sights as I drove to the main market. It's very bizarre. Bombay is a city of contrasts. It's got some amazing Victorian architecture in the middle of this chaotic urban mess.